Welcome to Artflex on CBA TV. This is Mathieu Olawi, the regular host of this very unique show. And uh, today, not tomorrow, today we will be going to the European world again. We were in Greece, if you remember, with um, Dr. Christopher Velazaru. Today we are going to Sweden and we'll be meeting somebody that I'm very sure by the time you see the person, you get to understand that uh, this person is vast when it comes to exploration of not only Sweden, but the entire part of the globe. See you there. Welcome back to the other side of the studio. Uh, today, as I've told you earlier, we will be considering the Swedish literature. And who am I dealing with today? I'll be dealing with uh, Bengt O. Jocknard. Um, who is this uh, wonderful writer? Um, from his appearance, you can see that um, he has been in the literary world for many years, for over five decades. Um, Bengt O. Jocknard was born in 1949. So, and uh, he moved from one part of the world to another. He has got a lot of experiences. I don't want to go deeply into um, his life, but because we're going to be discussing about a lot of things about him. Uh, but, but I want you to understand that uh, this man is a musician, is a poet, a national beat poet laureate. He received that international award in the United States last year and it will be hosting international beat laureate across the globe in Sweden in 2020. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, please tell us about the Swedish and the literary world of the Swedish. What is it about? Well, Sweden has a very strong and old tradition in Liter literary tradition. We have some really f good poets, Harry Martinson, we have uh, Thomas Tranströmer, we have both of them got the Nobel Prize. Uh, and there are many others, uh, Boo Berryman, and uh, from the old school. And today, their poetry is very, very popular and very big in Sweden today. Um, not the big publishing houses, they don't publish so much poetry. So most poetry is living in, how you say, underground. But there, there is a strong literary tradition in this country, I would say. So actually, in, in, in Sweden, are you, uh, do, would you say that writers uh, work individually or collectively? Yes. In the old days, there were, there were uh, groups of writers joining together and going for manifestos, and there were poets, etc. But today, no, everybody sits in their own chamber and writes either novel, mystery, novel, or poetry, or whatever. So what would you say uh, it led to the change in the way of life of the Swedish people? I, th I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's happening all over the world. I mean, the world is getting more egotistic and more individual. Um, uh, I think the idea of working together is, to many people, it's like uh, socialism is like an ugly word today. And, uh, and when, you, when people join together to, to, to have a common goal, you're usually branded as a socialist or a communist or something. So I think that's one of the reasons. Today, it's, uh, I think it's a global thing. I mean, people are not as much in communities or in social gatherings like they used to be. Uh, will you say that um, there's no influence of modern technology in uh, the Swedish writer's life or let's say the Swedish life? Yes, I mean, yeah, if, if you're talking about like Facebook or I guess Facebook is the biggest one when it comes to poetry. Mm. Um, that I have so many poets on my Facebook wall. I mean, I have like almost 5,000 people on my list and most of them are poets or artists or musicians. Um, yeah. And I think 
yes, it's a, the, 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 the social media is, is a great thing. I, I love social media. It's one of the best things that's happening for the artistic people. Uh, because we, we have a chance to, to join hands and to talk to each other and do things. But so far, I haven't. There are many groups, like for on Facebook, there are many, many poetic, artistic groups, etc. But it's not like in the old days where you joined, uh, when we were in the same place and you talked about things. And you, you, just, you I, I like the physical. So, what do you mean? Are you trying to say that you are more of a, a traditionalist uh, or less modernist? So, w what are you trying to say? Does it mean you are not really going with the trend of the modern um, system with regards to uh, living one's life uh, operationally or dealing with other people across the, the world? I guess I'm a bit of both. But I, I, because I'm, I'm traditional in the way that I... I mean, I started, I wrote my first poem, like, it's more than 50 years ago, in jail in Turkey, uh, in English, because nobody spoke Swedish. And so, mm -hmm. and, and I studied all the old masters, like Blake and T.S. Eliot and Dylan Thomas and Shakespeare, and I tried to write sonnets, and I tried to write rondos, I tried to write all the classical styles of poetry. So I, mm -hmm. I am schooled in an old tradition. But even so, uh, I see myself as a modern person too because of the social media and the, the, the opportunities that social media offers for, for creative people today. Are you an isolationist? Does it mean you isolate yourself? Yes, and no, because the, 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 my isolated status at this point in my life is not all so... Good chosen mm -hmm. uh, just happened like this I mean I, like 20 years ago I was a very social person and, and socializing with lots of people living in the city now I live outside the city in a villa and I have no, no contacts with my neighbors I have no contacts with hardly anyone except for social media uh, so it's, um, it's I don't know how to answer your question actually <laughs> All right, let's, let's uh, go back to what we're talking about. Uh, how is Swedish world now compared to the past? Socially, it's turning more extreme, right-wing extreme, I'm sorry to say. 20% mm -hmm. of the Swedish people vote for an ex right extreme party last election. Uh, mm -hmm. Economically, the... Uh, the conservatives of this country have uh, running uh, all kinds of schemes to, to 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 shift the wealth from the common coffers to the private coffers, and uh, and the, the the gap between the rich and the poor is 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 it's mad. It's going so fast. It's it's the opening like a chasm, and it's opening very fast. So. I'm not very happy about my country today. So let's deviate from the writing world. What about the publishing world or publishing activities in Sweden? It's, it's, it's for poetry, it's really, really bad because the, the big publishing houses, the only published poets that are even friends or family, it's nepotism. And uh, usually it has to be a young, usually a woman. I don't mind young and women, but you understand what my point is. It has to be so socially correct. It's only yeah. like like an old poet like I. It's not considered for publication in the in the big publishing houses. So uh, and, and that goes. I mean, it, there are so many poets in this country, uh, especially on on social media. You can see. I mean. It, I have like probably like two thousand Swedish poets on my wall, and uh, the, not all of them are good, of course. Uh, but some of them are really good, but none are get none are getting published. So mm -hmm. I think it's the, the publishing situation in Sweden is very difficult, and uh, no one wants to bet on a new 
poet. So what are Swedish writers, uh, Swedish writers generally doing to reduce the challenges faced by uh, Swedish or upcoming Swedish writers? Since there are a lot of challenges that they face with regards to publication of their work, what are they doing? The only option left are, of course, are small publishing houses or self-publishing. Yeah, self-publishing is, uh, is one way to get yourself to the market, particularly when you don't have the network to get your work published. Uh, it's not only in Sweden, it happens every other part of the world too. Um, their viewers at home, uh, at least we've been able to understand the world of the Swedish. And then uh, we have got to know what are some of the pros and the cons of writing as Swedish. Uh, we will have to go for a break now. When we come back, we'll be discussing about the world of this great writer himself. See you then. Out there. Tune in to CBA TV, the voice of East Africa and beyond. Uh, There's so many people around the world who are watching along with you. Welcome back to the second part of this wonderful show at Flix. If you are joining us for the first time, this is the only show in the entire Africa where we explore the world of the people through literature. We've taught different parts of the world. Today, we are dealing with Swedish world. And we are dealing with uh, Bengt O. Joknod, who has been trying to help us to explore this as a citizen of this wonderful nation, Sweden. Uh, Bengt, can you now, we're moving to your own part of the world. Tell us about your life before 1968. You were born in, in, in 1949. How about your life before 1968? What happened? How did you spend it? Before 19, 1968, I was 19 years old. Um, and I was a hippie. Uh, it was the era of the flower power. Mm. Uh, before that, uh, I was a regular kid, I don't know, I, 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 was, I went to school, I listened to Tommy Steele and Elvis Presley and uh, Little Richard and whatever. Um, the, the, the Sweden in the, in the 50s and the 60s was very safeguarded and secure and very, how shall I say, very conservative too, as a social conservative in a sense, because it, I didn't like the social democrats even at that time, because they were so, it was the old generation and they really had the, the mandate to decide what was good for the country. And when, when 1967, 68 rolled around, we had completely different ideas. Your, your biodata shows that um, you were in Turkey in 1968. What took you there? Well, in, in the 66, in 1967, I met a lot of people, travelers, at, at, because India was very popular at that time, and you had the magic bus that traveled for Europe, to Delhi, etc. And many people traveled back and forth, all because you could travel by bus through Persia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, everything was peaceful at that time. And I met, so I, I, I encountered a lot of people that had traveled this way, so I decided in 1968 I'd go to India. That's where I was going. Uh, so I, I hitchhiked with a Swedish girl and, and I ended up in Istanbul. But then we split up and I got stuck and then I got busted. Uh, okay. What about the case of uh, the $20 worth of ashes? What, what do you mean by that? What could have $20 given you challenges, uh, different, uh, things beyond your expectation in Turkey? What happened? 
that means uh, I, I met a Japanese girl in the December 1968, and she gave me twenty dollars. I went out to buy some dope. The next day, the police kicked down our door because I guess the, the Turks that sold it to me told the police. So the next day, the police kicked down my door and they, they arrested me and the Japanese girl and took us to jail. And at that time, I also had a very, very heavy psychosis. So I, I was in very bad shape and the police took me. So, so how did you learn uh, cooking, yoga, and some other things that in Turkey, you, are, you, you were not born or raised. You had no family in Turkey. How could you learn this within the time that you spent there, despite all the challenges that you felt, that you faced there? No, 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 because uh, I was in Turkey for almost five years, four years, four and a half years. And uh, the first year was heavy, but then I started to, to accept the fact that I was there, and I met a lot of fascinating people in there. And they knew how to cook, so I learned how to cook. They were poets, so I started to write poetry. They were artists, so I started to paint. They were musicians, so I, my mother gave me a flute and a guitar, and I started to write songs on the guitar. And in in a, in a certain sense, the, the Turkish jail was like a university or a monastery to me. I learned everything I do today. I learned there. Oh, does that mean that you didn't study literature at the initial stage of your life? You just ga uh, you gather it from the people that you found um, in your trip to the exploration of the world. Later, I went to an art school in England, and uh, no, I never studied. Yeah, then I studied English literature in University of Stockholm much later. But no, the, my whole my whole uh, artistic endeavor in my life started there, and then it, it never stopped. It, it carries on. Uh, okay, how about the people that you met in, in Turkey? Uh, I'm sure that um, as you have had a change in your life, something must have, uh, or, or people around you must have inspired you. Tell us about at least two of those people that you can never forget. You mentioned Atta and another person. Let, let me say, first of all, both of them have passed away since many, many years. The, the, the Japanese guy, Koshi Morishita, he was, he got busted, he got caught together with me because the police, they, they, they tortured me. So I gave up his name, I gave up any name, so they took him. And so he was in jail with me and he got eight and a half years for nothing. I got 12 years and three months for these 20 grams. And, uh, but he was a really good artist and he gave me, in a sense, I don't know, he gave me the weightlessness of painting a fruit on a bough, on a tree, and it's, I don't know, it's, 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 that, that experience still stays with me. And uh, he, he was also very good at drawing, and yeah. So I, I started, my painting started with, with sort of trying to paint like he did. And then later, of course, I, I developed, and uh, to, today I go completely my own style. But yeah, and Antonio Rassili was uh, a rather known Italian artist, Dadaist, beat poet, and uh, he was very known in the these biennials in Italy. And he he was the one that was talking to me. He was very intellectual. I had not even gone to the to the high school, and he talked to me about things. And it was like it was like finding out a completely new world. I mean, he gave me all the poets and the writers and the philosophers, and like and I started to read anthropology and mythology, and so and I, I can. He had an immense impact in my life. Uh, okay, uh, let's look at 1973, between 1973 and 1974. Uh, according to your biography, or about that, uh, you were in Stockholm. How did you live your life when you went back to Stockholm? Yeah, well, I, I flew back with the Interpol because I was 12 years and three months. It was a center, so, so they, finally they, they, they changed the law in Sweden so they could take me home. 
So I flew with the Interpol and they, they stopped, stuck me in a jail, a heavy security jail in Sweden for half a year. Really bad. Worse than Turkey. And, but when, when I finally, in, in the autumn of 1973, the king gave me a pardon. So I was released. And then immediately I, I got a passport and I traveled through Europe just enjoying being free and enjoying meeting people. I met some amazing people during this trip. It was in uh, October, November. It was getting cold, but I didn't mind. I was hitchhiking. And then in, uh, when I came back to Stockholm in December, then I got my own apartment in Stockholm, and I started to paint, really painting for the first time seriously, and I was painting every night for half a year. I, I produced so many paintings. And later they were in an exhibition in Denmark. Your life is so interesting that uh, I also noticed that you did not stay even in Stockholm. Um, you later moved, yeah, as you have said now, you later moved to the UK. You moved to the UK, right? Um, in 1974. That means that you didn't spend a long time in, uh, in Sweden. Um, Tell us about your life in uh, Boston in particular, because uh, you, you live in Boston for some time, particularly when you were with uh, Chris. Chris actually was a musician I met in jail in Turkey. Uh, he had, it's a long story, but he, he had come back from India with his wife, his wife at the time, her kids, a monkey, and 20 kilos of hash in a big bus. And uh, they got busted in Istanbul. Uh, and when we, when we were in jail in, in Istanbul, we all talked about when we all get free, we're going to start a circus that can change this world. He said, we're going to make a circus that has poetry, music, dance, health, food, theater, whatever. And so we started to work on this goal. And in 1974, Chris actually came with a big removal van to Stockholm. I said, OK, it's time, it's time to move to England. So I put all my stuff in this van, and I moved to England. And we started a rock and roll band in a place called uh, Bolton. No, first in Darwin, later in Bolton. And we started to rehearse, and well, it's a long story. But anyway, I, I moved to England, and I lived in England for a couple of years. All right, a year later, uh, um, in 1975, according to your biography, you met Joe. Who was Joe in your life? Yeah, because I was traveling through Europe all the time. I was based in, in first in Bolton, first in Darwin, then in Bolton, then later in London. The band mm -hmm. broke up. <coughs> and uh, I was traveling through Europe. I was living in Amsterdam. I was living in Christiania in Copenhagen. And while I was living in Christiania in Copenhagen, I was walking through the streets of Copenhagen one day, and I, and I went into this gallery, and I met this American guy. And... Uh, his name was Joe Banks, and I showed him some photographs of my, of my paintings, and he was really fired up. He really liked it. He said, you want to exhibit? I said, yes, I'd love to. So that's how it started. That was my first exhibition. All these years, from the time that you entered the literary world, of uh, the creative world, you were involved in music, writing, poetry in particular, but at a stage, especially between 2002 and 2019, you were fully involved in journalism. What happened along the line? Why did you switch? No, well, I, 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 was, an art, I was a journalist before that. I was, I was a journalist already at the beginning of the 90s for, for various magazines. Uh, but in nineteen in two thousand and one, I was I got a request from the social welfare sy system in Stockholm if I would like to help a, a gypsy man to make a magazine. Uh, and I said, okay, why not? So they they pay me to be his teacher. But then I got stuck, and I, I was doing this magazine for nineteen years. Uh, it was the biggest. Roma, which we call them Roma in Sweden, Roma magazine in Sweden. And uh, but last year, it, the, the funding was cut, so the the, the 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 magazine went down. 
I think we've known, our, our viewers at home also have known a little bit about you, but they would want to know, uh, they want to know more about your literary work. We have to explore one. Among all the poems that you've written, over 6,000, et cetera, that you've written, which one is your favorite? I've written thousands of poems. I, cannot, I cannot even remember all of them. <laughs> but if, if you ask me what book I like the best, I think the, the first book I made with, with uh, Dominic Williams uh, and his publishing house, Econow in Wales, that's probably the book I feel most pleased with so far. Uh, okay. Um, would you mind just uh, give us some of the lines? Let's listen and then we can explore that together. Puddles of wet word joy shines in spite on canvas of it all. There are worms in my fight for regard. I am hollow. Dice is my name. Crossed fingers and a special resilience. Dipped in ambiguity and a kind of loneliness birds respond to. I am the sea of images. A tonality ocean snow, a final fall upon the shore. This is rhythmic uh, poem. I enjoy the flow as you are reciting the poem. Uh, for the viewers at home to understand this, would you mind uh, just exploring this poem with our viewers at home? It's about life, it's about uh, like puddles of wet word joy, it's about writing, uh, how, how writing can shine dis despite everything that happens. And it's like I'm, I'm making a reference to canvas because well, I'm a painter, so I'm com comparing the world to a canvas and we, are, we the poets are using poetry in that sense. And I'm saying dice is my name, cross fingers and a special resilience because everything we do is always subjected to chance and, and dipped in ambiguity and a kind of loneliness birds respond to. I mean, ambiguity, I mean, everything you, you, can, you can read in different ways. And in a sense, I mean, in a sense, we are even in, in group, we are always, in a sense, lonely. And this kind of, and I'm saying here is that this kind of a loneliness that I'm talking about, this kind of loneliness that even birds can understand. And in the final verse, I say, I am the sea of images, a tonality, oceans, no, a final fall upon the shore. It's a kind of uh, description, I guess, of, uh, you might say, even pompous, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's who I am. I, I am a sea of images. Uh, because images is all I have, both in my poetry and in my art. How would you describe yourself? Are you a romanticist or a romantic uh, poet? There's a well between romanticism and romantic. So you appreciate nature. Or what kind of, how would you describe yourself in a simple sense? As a writer or as a poet? I, I, I'm a naturalist, a, rom a romantic poet, and also a very realistic one. I write a lot about war. Mm -hmm. and, I, yes. oh, and, of, and, and I often mix the three senses. I mean, I can write about migratory birds that arrive in Sweden in the spring, and I listen to them, and I can hear them talk about the war in the country they just came from. Um. As we are moving towards the end of this, I would want you to give us a little bit information about your plan to host the world in Sweden with regards to your, uh, the Swedish National Beat Festival, which is taking place this year. Well, I'm, I'm going to arrange a festival in Stockholm in August, August 10 to August 17. Uh, a festival that's going to be take place every day for a week. And I'm invited, people are coming from the States, from England, from Wales, from Germany, from Greece, and from Hungary. And from Sweden, of course. So I think I have like 16 poets that are going to perform, and it's going to be music, 
And this is third time I do the Internet, the Stockholm International Beat Poetry Festival. It's the third time it's a kind of a Biennale. I do it every second year. I wish you best of luck. Um, I hope we will be able to connect with you when this uh, uh, historical festival will be taking place in, uh, in Sweden. Um, what would be your last message for our viewers at home? Um, whether in the area of uh, art or general life, as someone who has got vast experience in different parts of the globe. Never give up. The word poetry and art is the two most important, and music, I would say, especially for Africa. I mean, I, mean, I know how important dance and music is to Africa. I mean, the cu culture is the, the backbone of humanity. And never forget that. Thank you so much, Banks. We really enjoy having a session with you. I think this is going to be memorable for our viewers at home. Uh, thank you so much. I, I believe when we call you next time, we'll surely have something relevant to do together, particularly after the festival. Thank you for joining us. Dear viewers at home, um, this is where we're going to put the cutting of this session. And uh, I believe that when we meet next time, you will still enjoy this very important, unique show on Netflix, Otke Bariga Africa, the only TV station in East Africa that voices for the voiceless. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs>